Here in our sermon series through the book of Daniel, I thought I'd start with something a little bit different today. I printed out a poem in your bulletin, and I just wanted to read it to you as we uh, begin. It's a poem that supposedly champions the strength of the human spirit. It was written by William Ernest Henley, and it is called Invictus. Uh, Listen to these famous words. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank my whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. The scriptural text before us today from the book of Daniel is about the most dangerous sin there is. It is the sin of pride. It's dangerous because it sets the soul against the Most High God. It's dangerous because it's destructive uh, to you and to those around you, and it's dangerous, perhaps most of all, because it is invisible to the one who possesses it. Uh, Pride hides itself like a germ that cannot be seen with the naked eye, and so you will be the last one to see the pride in your own life, though it will be so obvious to the rest of us around you. It's interesting to me that for centuries, Christians have labeled pride as one of the seven deadly sins, Uh, and yet today it doesn't get a whole lot of attention like some of those other sins. Augustine said that pride is the root of all other evils. It's pride that says, God, I don't want it your way. I want to do it my way. It's pride that says, God, I don't want your laws. I don't care about what you think is best. I want what I think is best. My feelings, my desires are the most important thing. So pride is ugly. And so we must be on guard and vigilant about bringing this ugly sin out into the light because it is so dangerous. And so today, uh, we're gonna look at two very famous men who displayed this characteristic. Their story is in Daniel chapter four and five. I have so enjoyed studying Daniel again this summer. It's actually one of my favorite, favorite narratives in the whole Bible, because it's such a powerful story. It's the end of the story of King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who we met uh, before, and I've really, been helped greatly by a commentator named Tremper Longman and his work on the book of Daniel, as well as the work of a pastor named Andy Stanley, and then lastly, the work of a scholar named John Goldengay, who wrote about the historical background here. And so I hope I can convey to you uh, that which I have learned. And today we will see three movements in our story. Uh, We will see the humiliation, uh, we will see the restoration, and then we will see the writing on the wall. Three movements. If you haven't been here the last few weeks, let's kind of have a little bit of review. As they say uh, previously on our series through the book of Daniel, uh, we learn in in chapter one uh, that in the year 586 BC, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar conquered the city of Jerusalem and he took a lot of things of value, uh, like some of the treasures from the temple. But one of the other things that he took was the best and the brightest men of the city that he conquered, and he would take them back to Babylon and teach them to walk and talk like a Babylonian, and then incorporate them into his palace guard. And so he was surrounded by all these really smart people because uh, he wanted to have the benefit of the wisdom of the nations, and that was a really good idea. One of the men that he took was named Daniel, and he had three friends, you remember their names, right? What are they? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So that was chapter one. In chapter two, uh, you remember the king had this troubling dream, and he calls all the wise men, the magists of his palace, and says, listen, I had this dream. I don't know what it means. Can you help me interpret this dream? But listen, to be honest with you, I'm a little suspicious of you guys. I have a hunch that you're kind of making this stuff up half the time. So this time, I'm not even going to tell you what my dream is. This time, I want you to tell me what my dream was. After all, you're supposed to know these things. You're in touch with the gods. And then you can tell me uh, what it means as well. And if you can't, I will have you all put to death. 
So, of course, all the wise men are like, man, we can't do that. Only the gods could do that. And he's about to put them all to death until a young Jewish kid named Daniel says, hold on, give me a little time. I want to go back and pray, and I'll come back and figure this out for you with my God's help. Uh, Sure enough, Daniel does come back, tells him not only the exact dream, but the interpretation of the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar is amazed by this, and he says, wow, Daniel, your God is a God of gods. That's chapter two. And then we see in chapter three, a little time goes by, and King Nebuchadnezzar kind of forgets about all that. And aren't we like that sometimes? In chapter three, uh, the king says, I want everyone to bow down and worship this image that represents me and my authority. I want everyone to swear allegiance uh, to me. Everybody has to bow down. But then those three men that we talked about earlier, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, said, no, we refuse. You can do whatever you want to do to us. Throw us into the furnace. Uh, We believe our, our God can deliver us from that. We're believing that he will deliver us from that. But even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down. It's amazing faith. So they, they take them, they throw them into the fiery furnace, and they heat it up really hot, and that's it for them. But the only problem is they won't burn. And so they take them out, and King Nebuchadnezzar sees all this, and he goes, oh, my word. Wow, okay, new rule. Uh, these, these three guys are still alive. From now on, no one is allowed to say anything negative about their God. Uh, we will never forget, forbid that kind of thing ever again. And that's the end of chapter 3. And today we reach chapter 4. My point in reviewing all that is just to remind you that at this point in the narrative, King Nebuchadnezzar has had some experiences with the one true God. But some time passes. And in between chapter 3 and chapter 4, about 25 years go by. And at that time, Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. Let's take a look at chapter 4 and verse 1. It says this. I, Nebuchadnezzar was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. Remember, Pastor Bob mentioned when we were going through chapter two that dreams were thought of uh, back then as messages from the gods, unlike today where we tend to think, that, think of them as uh, indicating some sort of inner uh, struggle. Uh, the other thing I just want you to notice about verse one is the person who's speaking. Uh, it is Nebuchadnezzar writing in the first person, recording this down in the palace journal later on the prophet Daniel incorporates this into the book of Daniel but I want you to notice that chapter 4 is written in the first person and here's what he says let's drop down to verse 10 these are the visions I saw while lying in bed I looked and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land its height was enormous And then he goes on to describe this tree, how it grew large and it grew strong and its leaves were beautiful and its fruit was abundant and on it there was food for all. Under it the wild animals would come uh, and find shelter and the birds would live in the branches and, and from this tree every creature on earth was fed. But then there's this voice uh, from an angel, from a heavenly messenger that comes from heaven in verse 14 and says this, cut down the tree. Cut it down, cut it down, cut it down. Cut down the tree. All there's left after that is this stump, and then they say, now bind the stump. And then there's these voices that come, a whole group of heavenly messengers who give him the reason for cutting it down, the reason for this whole dream. And here's what they say in verse 17. The decision is announced by the messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know And let's say this part in yellow together, ready? That the most high is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. And so Nebuchadnezzar tells him this dream. And Daniel, after hearing this, becomes terrified. And the king even tries to calm down Daniel. He says, yeah, come on, Daniel, it can't be so bad. I mean, don't let this thing bother you. This isn't such a big deal. I'm the king of the whole world after all. But then Daniel says, if only this dream was about your enemies. But it's not. It's about you. You are the tree and the dream. Verse 24. This is the interpretation. Your majesty, 
And this is the decree that the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals and you will eat grass like the ox. And King Nebuchadnezzar says, you mean like that's a figure of speech, right? Daniel says, no, no, literally. This is going to be the way it is for you for a long time until you acknowledge something once and for all, Nebuchadnezzar, until you acknowledge that, let's say it again, the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, you need to recognize something, that you are a king, but you are not the king. 26. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Heaven rules, not you. Now that's an interesting phrase. It's only found one time in the whole Bible. Heaven rules. Can we say that together? Heaven rules. That means our God rules as king from heaven. See, the scriptures teach us that our God stands above and is in complete charge of everyone and everything. He is supreme in power, rank, and authority. If there was an organizational chart for the whole universe, God would be at the top of the pyramid because heaven rules. So many different scriptures teach this truth, the absolute sovereignty of God. Take, for example, what we call the enthronement psalms, uh, the psalms in the 90s. Psalm 96.10, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Psalm 97.1, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Psalm 99.1, the Lord reigns, let the people tremble. Psalm 103.19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. The psalmist declares this one truth to all the other nations, saying, in a sense, sorry about your God, but heaven rules. Which means it's not human leaders who rule. And it's not circumstances which rule. And it's not mankind who rules. It is heaven who rules. Abraham Kuyper famously said, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Heaven rules. That was true then and it's true today. After this, Daniel begs the king to repent of his behavior. Look at verse 27. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. Notice, Daniel tells him, Take care of the oppressed. That's what a good king is supposed to do, to take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. That's what good, godly leaders are commanded to do. The scriptures say that's what we are to do, to take care of the poor, to take care of the widow, to take care of the orphan. And so, in other words, Daniel says, uh, don't be so puffed up with your pride. Instead, become a humble servant leader. That's what God wants from those who have possessions and power and authority. And Daniel says, if you do that, then perhaps this horrible dream won't come to pass. And so we won't, we we as readers are kind of hearing Daniel's Daniel's advice here. We're wondering, is the king gonna take that advice? What's gonna happen? How will he respond? What will he do? Well, the text tells us, 29. 12 months later, As the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Oh man, if this was a movie, the music just changed, right? We as the audience are screaming back at the screen, No! Why did you say it like that? It reminds me of that time when LeBron James lost crucial game five in the NBA finals a few years ago and the press were asking him about how he was gonna confidently move forward in light of the fact that he just lost and I don't know if you remember what he said, but I remember. He said, well, the reason why I feel confident is I feel confident because I'm the best player in the world. It's that simple. 
LeBron went on to lose the finals in the very next game. It was almost like a bad omen, too. That's kind of what's going on here with King Nebuchadnezzar. As right then, right as he says these words, a voice comes from heaven and says, 31, this is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live like the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. And let's say this together. Until you acknowledge that the most high sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Notice the repetition there in Hebrew. That's a literary technique, and it's almost like we as the audience are saying, how many times is it going to take you to get it, Nebuchadnezzar? But aren't we like that? Apparently not yet, though, because then it says in verse 33, immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Wow. That sounds so weird, doesn't it? Is this true? Uh, did you know that there's actually a delusional mental condition that describes this called boanthropy? You can Google it. You can look it up. I'm not kidding. It's when a person actually thinks they're a cow or, or an ox. I read about this one guy in Great Britain who, who was like this for five years. He was in a mental institution, and they would let him out, and he would go out and act like a cow all day and kind of graze out there. And then they would give him his meds and let him back in, and he would go to bed. This is what happens to King Nebuchadnezzar. This is the great humiliation. Now let's take a look at the restoration. After this time period, scholars disagree, but probably about seven years, it says this in verse 34, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. dominion. Whose dominion? God's dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Whose kingdom? God's kingdom. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, Praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. Wow! Isn't that an amazing story? The most powerful man in the whole world is humbled by the king of kings. Why? Because heaven rules. That's the story of Nebuchadnezzar. And here's kind of the lesson for us from chapter four. As the scripture tells us in Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. See, friends, in your life, we have two choices. You, you can either humble yourself before God or you can be humbled by God. You can either humble yourself before God or you can be humbled by God. And let me suggest to you doing the first option. This message is not just about a prideful king back then long ago, though. This message is about that prideful thing inside of me today. Because his story is my story. This is the human condition. This message is about addressing that ugly sin of pride that will destroy you and everything around you. See, it's pride that keeps me from admitting what I should admit to. It's my pride that keeps me from listening when I really should be listening. It's pride that makes my head so big in the room that nobody else can fit in the room. Here's a picture of what we look like when we're puffed up in our pride. <laughs> and it's not that my pride needs to be tamped down a little bit. It's not that my pride needs to be managed. It's that my pride needs to die. There's no room for it in your life. Now let me just give you a, a Christian counseling perspective on this issue. You know why people sometimes come across as proud and cocky and arrogant? 
we all know something deep down is wrong with us. We live in a fallen world. And deep down, we're aware of that. And so our pride sometimes is our way of self-medicating that pain. And then someone pokes a hole in what I was trying to do or trying to portray myself to be, and then I get upset and I get angry, and my pride rears its ugly head. But the problem is I'm trying to find my sense of identity, my sense of worth, my sense of significance in something other than being a child made in the image of God and bought with the precious blood of Christ. Amen. Scott Sauls says it this way in his excellent book, From Weakness to Strength, genuinely good endeavors become broken endeavors when we start depending upon them to satisfy our thirst for love, esteem, applause, and approval in ways that only Jesus can. And so this could come in many forms. The possibilities are endless. My work, my achievements, my physical appearance, my money, my family, my whatever. But all those sources will, of my identity will eventually fail me. Because as Saul goes on to say, our hearts are going to be insecure until they find their security in God. Amen. The only source of esteem that won't ever fail you or abandon you is the smile of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only source of worth that will always love you even when you mess up is Jesus Christ. The only place we can be fully known and still unconditionally accepted when we're exposed at our worst is in Jesus Christ because he has taken away our shame at the cross. And so only when I'm found in Christ can I return back to the Garden of Eden and again be naked and without shame. In him, there's nothing more to fear. There's nothing more for me to prove. There's nothing really to hide. There's no need to self-promote. When I'm in him, there's no need to, to compete. There's no need to name drop. Believer, here's the truth. You need to raise your eyes toward heaven and have your sanity restored. Amen. You don't need to strive to be the most awesome. You don't need to constantly work on your self-esteem. You don't need the approval of others. You need to take on God's approval and then realize your soul was made to esteem something so much bigger than yourself because the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms and he gives them to whoever he wishes. Okay, I could say a lot more about that, but there's a whole other chapter. So we're going to move on to the third movement in our story today. We've seen the humiliation, we've seen the restoration, and now, movement three, we're going to see the writing on the wall. After Daniel chapter four, that is the end of the story of Nebuchadnezzar. His narrative is finished. And between chapter four and chapter five, like 40 years go by. And the Babylonian empire and its power is beginning to wane. And a big empire in Persia is gaining ground. King Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar, was leading and in control of the city of Babylon. But at this point, the city of Babylon, portrayed by these walls behind me today, is surrounded by Persians and Cyrus the Great has come to conquer the city. But Belshazzar isn't concerned at all because he thinks this city with its walls can never be taken. You see, you need to know that the city of Babylon contained two of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The first were the hanging gardens, but the second was the city walls. Scholars say the walls were so thick on the top, there was enough space to race two chariots side by side on top of the wall. Belshazzar is thinking, these walls are so strong. You can't get over them. You can't get through them. You can't get under him. And so just to kind of thumb his nose at the Persians, he throws this big banquet, this big feast, the very same night the city is surrounded. And he dedicates this banquet to the god of the Babylonians, the god Marduk. Now, just a little more background, because you have to understand this. Going back to Nebuchadnezzar, whenever he would conquer a city, he would always take the idol of that city, that city's God, and bring it back to Babylon. And so he had kind of a God collection, like trophies, like antlers on the wall. And so at this party, Belshazzar brings out, first of all, the statue of Marduk. He brings it out, sets it in the middle of the banquet hall, but then he brings out all these other gods 
and sets them around Marduk in submission to him to represent the fact that our God, Marduk, can protect us from any other nation and any of the other nation's gods. After all, look at how many cities we've conquered. But remember, when Nebuchadnezzar had gone into Jerusalem, when he went into the temple, he didn't find an idol there because the Jews don't worship statues or idols. That was forbidden by the Ten Commandments. The living God is too majestic to ever be represented by a statue. We worship the invisible sovereign God. So he did the next best thing. They stole everything else they could from the temple. And they steal these items, furnishings, and other furniture that represented the Jewish God. We saw those earlier in chapter 1. And so what Belshazzar does is he finds the golden goblets that they took from the Jewish temple, and he begins to use those goblets at this party. Can you see the profanity of that? Can you see the blasphemy of that? In the temple, there was a sharp and definite division between that which was common and that which is holy. And I don't know exactly what these vessels were used for in the rituals of the temple, but I know they're not intended for this kind of idolatrous, licentious party. I know that. So right in the middle of the party, you got to just imagine the arrogance and the showing at this big banquet. Suddenly, out of nowhere, they all look up at the wall. And it's almost like paint and plaster is like falling off the wall. Look at verse 5. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall. At that point, the party kind of stops. The music Cut the music. Everybody's goblet goes down. God himself has decided to crash this party. And even the king is looking up at the hand. And the text tells us the king, Belshazzar's face went white. Take a look. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak, and his knees were knocking. You ever been scared like that? And then he called for all his wise men to tell him what this writing on the wall said, but no one could tell him. And he offered them all kinds of things to the one who could tell him what it said. You'll be next to my kingdom. I'll give you this, that, and the other thing, on and on and on. But nobody could read it. And then Belshazzar's wife remembered Daniel. You've got to picture the scene. At this point, Daniel is in his 70s. He's an older man now. They bring him in. Daniel looks up at the wall. Daniel looks at the king. And this is what happened. Man, this is a good story. Is this not a great story? You guys got to read your Bibles. This is exciting stuff in here. First, Daniel says, you can keep all your gifts and your promotions. I don't want that. I'm going to tell you what it says. But first, I want to tell you something else. 18. Your majesty, the most high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. In other words, your father, which was really his grandfather, your father learned this hard lesson and he wrote it down in his journal. I know he told you, he told all of us. We all knew, look at verse 21. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged what? Say it together. That the most high God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. Yeah. 22. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You have 
the golden goblets, goblets from his temple brought to you, and you, you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drank wine from them? You praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze, and iron, wood, and stone who cannot hear or understand. You gotta just picture the room. There's all these idols right there in the middle, all these golds of bronze and silver who cannot hear or understand, including you, Marduk. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Wow. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. Can you imagine just being a fly on the wall at this banquet? You could hear a pin drop in the room at this point. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parsin. Here is what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Last word, Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Wow. Now, to me, here's what is so interesting about the Most High God. If you study the secular, historical background material on this, you find out that this night was October 12th, 539 BC. And if you like warfare and if you like history, you may know that a week or so before, Cyrus the Great, they didn't call him great for nothing, had redirected the Euphrates River and channeled it elsewhere. But the Euphrates River went right through the city of Babylon. I think I have a map of this on the, on the screen. And it went under the wall, and they built the wall on it on both sides. And so they redirected the river a week earlier. And so the level of the river had been dropping and dropping and dropping until on this night at sundown, perfect timing, finally it dipped be below the lowest point in the wall. And right as Daniel is at the banquet explaining all of this, the Persian army is slipping under the wall. And that very night the kingdom was taken. As it says in verse 30, that very night Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain because they executed him. Why? Because the most high God is sovereign over all and he sets over kingdoms whoever he wishes. Amen. Here's what this story means today. Here's what this story means for us. For anyone in here who has any kind of position of authority or power or prestige, whether it's at work, at school, in the church, in your family, wherever. Here's what this means. When things are going well for you, when you sit at the head of the conference table and all the eyes turn to you, when you drive up and look at your new beautiful house, or when you get into your new car and it has that new car smell, when you get that invitation you've been hoping to get and you finally get it, or when you sign that deal and there's a big check attached because you're the one responsible for doing a great job with that, or when you get that promotion, or when you get into that school, or when you win that award that, and you get recognized for something, and in that moment you have this thought and it's, hey, I kind of got it going on. In that moment, I want you to remember the writing on the wall. We need to remember this is a stewardship. If we have any position of authority whatsoever, it is because God has put us in that position. There's so many other variables that are outside of our control. We are allowed by God for a temporary season to have influence, and he expects us to be faithful. And remember, like him, our days were numbered too. One day it's all gonna end and I'm accountable for what I'm doing with the influence that God has given me. That's enough to humble us right there. Our days are numbered. 
That goes for everybody. That's such a humbling thought right there. Not only are our days numbered, but we too are accountable. I know some of you, you hold everybody else accountable, accountable to you all week long, and that's great. But did you know that there's somebody greater than you that will hold you accountable also? One day the Bible says that time will come, and when you stand before God and he says, what did you do with the stewardship that I gave you? In that moment, if your pride wells up in you, or if you have a know-it-all attitude, or if you're always quick to offer advice but slow to take any yourself, or if you're not teachable, I want you to realize that in that moment, you are letting the enemy slip under your wall. And I want you to look in the mirror and say, no, no, no pride. Wait a minute. I'm not going to be like Belshazzar here. I'm not going to have the Lord come to me, his son, or his daughter, his child, and have to say, you have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. i got to remember, I didn't get here on my own, and God placed me here. This is a stewardship. I'm accountable for what God has entrusted to me. And so instead, let me encourage you to look in the mirror and say, no pride. You can go back to hell where you came from. Because the Most High is sovereign over all, and he gives power to anyone he wishes. And that's how those of us here who've been entrusted with authority and power and possessions and prestige put our pride back in its place. And that's how those of us who have any kind of influence prove to God that we can be faithful and show him that he can trust us with more if he so chooses. Because Jeremiah the prophet said this, let not the rich man boast in his riches. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the strong man boast in his strength, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he knows and understands me, the Lord is God. Instead of pride, I'm going to instead clothe myself with something the Bible calls humility. Because here's what the New Testament scriptures teach us as they confirm what we see in the Old Testament today, 1 Peter 5, and I'll close with this verse. God says, this is what I want you all to do. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. So interesting to me, the word clothed there, written by Peter. It means to wrap yourself with a towel. And I can't help but to think what was on Peter's mind as he wrote these words. I'll bet he was remembering what the most powerful leader in the entire universe taught him about what to do with authority. The one who came not to be served, but to serve. The one who took a towel, wrapped it around his waist, and washed his disciples' feet. That's what true greatness looks like. You see, here's why Christianity is so unique. There have been many, many men who have exalted themselves to the position of God. But there has only been one God who condescended and humbled himself to become man. Amen. His name is Jesus Christ. And now he turns to you and he turns to me and he says, follow me. Can you imagine, church, if we had a church full of leaders like this? What kind of church would we be if we had a church full of people who were humble servant leaders. Let's be that church. Because the Most High is sovereign over all, and he gives authority and power and dominion to anyone he wishes. Amen? As the worship team comes, allow me to close with a rewritten version of the poem with which I began. I put this poem also in your bulletin today. It was written by Dorothea Day. After she was disturbed by the words of Invictus, she wrote a new poem called My Captain. Let me read it for you. Out of the night that dazzles me, bright as the sun from pole to pole, I thank the God I know to be for Christ the conqueror of my soul. Since his the sway of circumstance, I would not wince nor cry aloud. Under that rule with men, which men call chance, my head with joy is humbly bowed. 
Beyond this place of sin and tears, that life with him and his the aid, despite the menace of the years, keeps and shall keep me unafraid. I have no fear, though straight the gate. He cleared with punishments the scroll. Christ is the master of my fate. Christ is the captain of my soul. Amen. Amen.